Tonight, the Attorney General wants tech makers to leave back doors in devices. The Chinese government might be targeting Hong Kong protesters with malware. And Facebook apologizes to drag queens over a naming controversy. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 184 for Wednesday, October 1st, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Citrix Go to Assist, the number one global market leader in remote support. Sign up for Go to Assist before October 10th and get another Citrix product free for six months. Visit gotoassist.com and get started. Hey everybody, I'm Sarah Lane and let's get right into today's tech feed. Attorney General Eric H. Holder Jr. said yesterday at the Global Alliance Against Child Sexual Abuse Online conference that was going on in Washington, D.C., that new forms of encryption capable of locking law enforcement officials out of devices will only hurt investigations of kidnappers and sexual predators and put children in greater danger. Holder is the highest government official to publicly speak out against technology companies that are now encrypting data that could be potential evidence even when law enforcement has a search warrant. Holder did not mention Apple or Google by name, but these remarks are following both companies' announcements last month of new encryption policies that have sparked concern among government officials, including FBI Director James B. Comey last week. As thousands of protesters continue to demonstrate in Hong Kong, Lacoon Mobile Security has announced that it's been tracking the spread of a fake mobile app aimed at eavesdropping on protesters' communications. In what's known as a phishing attack, WhatsApp users in Hong Kong, quite a few of them actually, have been receiving a link to download the software along with a message that says, check out this Android app designed by Code4HK for the coordination of Occupy Central. Now, Code for HK is a community of programmers who've been working to support this movement of democracy in Hong Kong, but didn't have anything to do with this particular app. That's according to Lacoon Security. It's not the first time that the democracy movement happening in Hong Kong has prompted web attacks, though. Back in June, an unofficial referendum on Hong Kong's political future that allowed people in Hong Kong to vote online drew the largest denial of service attacks in history, according to Matthew Prince, who's the CEO of Cloudflare, which helped defend the referendum site from the attack at the time. If you're a Comcast X1 customer, you can now stream and download DVR recordings from anywhere, even away from your DVR at home. Today, Comcast announced the launch of live in-home streaming and its X1 DVR with cloud technology in the San Francisco Bay Area and Houston markets, which joined the Atlanta, Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. markets where this was already available. The company says it plans to offer these features to most of its X1 customers by the end of the year. However, Variety is already reporting that one device only can stream or download DVR content at a time so there are some limitations some cloud limitations but to watch recordings and live programming from your smartphone or tablet if you're a customer you'll need the xfinity tv app from either the google play or app store apple's app store anyway verizon is scrapping its plan for network optimization which would have restricted speeds for its heaviest unlimited data users when the LTE network was congested. That's on the very day that its new 4G network optimization policy was supposed to go into effect. Very 11th hour stuff here. Verizon's heaviest data users on grandfathered unlimited plans were facing throttled speeds to make room on the same LTE network for customers who pay for data by the gigabyte. But earlier today, Verizon said it would not indeed go ahead with this new policy. Back in July, the company started shipping notices to its unlimited plan customers, but argued that it wasn't truly throttling anybody because it didn't automatically restrict speeds to 2G or 3G rates when customers hit a predefined data limit each month. However, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler was not convinced and penned an angry letter to Verizon saying, what are you doing? Tell us what your motives are here. I'm paraphrasing him a little bit. Verizon is still restricting speeds for heaviest unlimited users on 3G, but at least for now, its LTE network will be left alone. Bank Innovation is reporting that iOS 8.1, not to be confused with 8.0.1, which was 
the sort of meltdown from last week. 8.1 will include Apple Pay, and the current expected timetable for the public release is scheduled for October 20th. That's at least according to multiple anonymous sources. iOS 8.1 contains hidden code that will allow Apple to test Apple Pay with the private beta release of iOS 8.1. That's according to both Bank Innovation and 9to5Mac. In other Apple October news, potential October news anyway, the company will add a gold color option to its full-size iPads in an effort to boost shipments this year. That's according to people familiar with the plan speaking to Bloomberg. New versions of the company's 9.7-inch pads, which are widely thought to be announced this month, possibly October 21st, may include gold as a choice of color for the rear metal cover, which would add to the silver and gray that are available for the lighter iPad Air and would also mirror the options that iPhone users have. Sales of the iPad have declined for the past two quarters after rising from $5 billion when the product was introduced, that was way back in 2010, to $30 billion in 2012. The last year, iPad sales produced $32 billion in revenue. Coming up, see how London is transforming some very historic phone booths into something quite modern. And up next, I'll chat with Reed Albergater from the Wall Street Journal about Facebook's big apology sparked by drag queens and real names. But first, let's take a moment to thank Citrix Go to Assist. Managing your company's IT support needs can be a challenge. I mean, you even if it's a small company, that's you know, you might be scaling, you've got a lot, got a lot of equipment, you've got remote or mobile employees. That's a lot of moving parts. Citrix Go to Assist is for you. It's the number one global market leader in remote support. It's easy to use, it's cloud-based, and it's a remote support solution that allows you and your team, your IT team, to solve problems faster. If you sign up for Go to Assist before October 10th, you'll get another Citrix product of your choice completely free for six months. So now's a really good time to check out go to assist remote support it lets you provide live and 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 remote support that you you can leave unattended to any computer, any mobile device. You can screen share with others and diagnose and, and fix support problems faster and more effectively. And GoToAssist has apps as well. So you can deliver support anytime, anywhere. You could be walking down the street, you could be at your desk, or you could be anywhere in between. If you work in IT, you've got to try GoToAssist. Sign up today. And like I said, you can get another Citrix tool completely free for six months. Citrix uh, is, uh, is a is a longtime sponsor of Twitter, and they've got some really great tools. Please do take advantage of this. Go to assist.com and get started. Again, the special offer ends October 10th. You That is now the first, so you get 10 days. Visit go to assist.com, sign up, and receive the special offer. And we thank our friends at Citrix for sponsoring this episode of Tech News Tonight. Joining me now is Reed Albergati, tech reporter over at the Wall Street Journal. Hey, Reed. How you doing? I'm doing really well, thank you. Um, are you ready for the postseason of baseball? Of course, of course I'm ready. <laughs> Here in San Francisco, my new home, the Giants are in the playoffs. Very happy. There you go. And 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 after your stints in San Diego and uh, and 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 the and the beautiful state of of Minnesota, I hope the best for you. <laughs> Thank you. In your Thank new you home. So, much. so I've been alluding to this whole Facebook apologizing to a group of drag queens over some sort of a naming controversy. I, you know, even if you're not familiar with the story, I know a lot of people are already familiar with the fact that Facebook has always taken a stance that whoever you are on Facebook has to be your actual identity. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, Facebook's been very strict about this over the years, even sometimes requiring political dissidents who are using fake names on Facebook to protect their identities against authoritarian regimes. But it actually, ironically, took a group of drag queens who were sort of outed on Facebook or at least forced to use their real name and were very angry about this to, to finally, it seems, loosen up this policy. Facebook's saying it's not it's not going to change its policies, but may be a little more lax on enforcement. Okay, so what exactly happened here? Facebook says, "Listen, this is you know, the, the, there's an apology being made, but we're not just going to change the the terms of usage of Facebook." Was there a particular Facebook group that that made enough of of noise and got enough you know likes and shares and attention to 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 to, to, to spark the company to to have to uh, address it? Well, yeah, there was this group of, you know, drag queens and also just the LGBT um, community that sort of got together 
and started this, you know, the, this organization, really uh, an impromptu organization to protest this policy. And, you know, it was actually one of the things that is credited with creating so much buzz around this other social media platform, Elo, where, you know, we've, we've seen Elo go from nothing to, you know, adding, I, I heard today, 50,000 users an hour now. And it's, it's partly because so many people in the LGBT uh, community really started signing up for Elo uh, thanks to this Facebook policy. You know, and you're- It's been really interesting. In your article, you and and you mentioned a few minutes ago that you know pol political dissidence is something where uh, you know the, having your real name really comes into play, and there are a lot of really good reasons that somebody might want to be online under a pseudonym. Okay, well, we're talking about you know people living under uh, uh, regimes not being able to use their real names. How did? Drag queens get this changed when you're talking sometimes at, at, at matters of life or death in other parts of the world. You know, I think I think it was just so striking, um, you know, that this was a policy. Facebook was was choosing to go after this group. I mean, it just reeks of, of discrimination. Um, and I'm not saying Facebook actually did seek out drag queens and, and try to enforce this. In fact, uh, Christopher Cox, who runs product for Facebook, the chief product officer, said that it was one user who flagged a bunch of drag queens saying these people are not using their real names. And because Facebook gets so many of these requests mm. every day, they didn't notice that there was this sort of anomaly. And, you know, had they noticed, they, they would have probably done something differently. So it just created a perfect storm. And then, of course, Facebook took a while to you know respond to this and and properly address it um and now they are they had a meeting at facebook headquarters today with you know a, a group a representative group of you know people from the lgbt community so um it, it's taken a few weeks but it looks like facebook is finally really kind of trying to end this controversy how does this play into facebook wanting to sell user data um in the form of ads ad network uh, we, you know we, we're hearing about facebook's widely successful ad network um particularly on mobile how does it how does it affect uh you know it, it, in an advertiser who really wants to market to what it you know what it thinks is a, a real identity rather than a stage name of some kind. It's a great, it's a great question. Actually, in New York this week at Advertising Week, um, a big organ, big get together, and for the advertising industry, Facebook launched or really relaunched Atlas, which is an advertising server. It allows advertisers to place ads all over the internet, but use Facebook's targeting capabilities. And the big push that Facebook has has sold to advertisers is that they have real identity, unlike Google, which is really the entrenched leader in this space. Uh, Facebook knows the real names, um, location, and gender of all the people on the service. Um, so at the same time, they're, they're sort of relaxing that policy. They've, they've really shown this week just how central real names, real identities are to their underlying business model. You mentioned Elo, uh, which is, of course, a, a, a new social network alternative uh, that, that has a different mission, at least right now, than, than a, a network like Facebook, and that there have been quite a few signups uh, as of late, and, and particularly in the LGBT community. But for, for most of the world, and most of the world at this point is on Facebook, and I would say the majority of those people, yeah, there's just a, there's a real name, and we're not necessarily going... Uh, going uh, under a variety of different pseudonyms. Does something like LL really have legs to compete with something like Facebook based on selling real identities uh, and the idea that you can be any anything that you want? I, no, I think it's so early to, to really say, yeah, Elo is going to be a competitor to Facebook. Um, you know, of course, anything can happen, and, and I wouldn't rule out the possibility that there will one day be a competitor to Facebook. In fact, Facebook doesn't rule, rule out that possibility. It's why they've gone out and acquired companies like Instagram and WhatsApp, which they're in the process of acquiring. Um, so, But I, I do think that it's really what's important about Elo is that it shows there is some frustration among Facebook users. It has become so big. There's 1.32 billion users on Facebook right now. And 
you know, it's, it's hard to be everything for everybody. And, you know, Facebook offers all these, you know, great features, but um, everybody has their little complaints about Facebook. And so I think that's something they're, they're really grappling with now. Reed Albergati's tech reporter over at the Wall Street Journal and a frequent guest here on TN2. Thanks for being back here, Reed, and let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Thanks. It's always good to be here. You can uh, follow me on Twitter at Reed Albergati, just my full name, and read articles on WSJ.com or our Digits blog or even WSJD.com. Excellent. Thanks so much, Reed. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. All right, finally, we mentioned London's famous red telephone booths. You can probably close your eyes and see them right now. They're very iconic, but they're also not really all that useful these days. So many of them are set to be converted into free solar-powered mobile charges that will provide a carbon-neutral source of energy throughout the city. The idea is called the Solar Box, and it was invented by two graduates of the London School of Economics. The solar boxes will be equipped with a solar panel, which provides a clean uh, source of energy. Costs for the green box are said to be uh, covered through in-kiosk advertisements, so free of charge. The mayor of London, Boris Johnson, supports the project and actually said in his 2014 low-carbon entrepreneur competition speech this summer, and I am not going to try a London accent here, in our modern world where hardly any Londoner is complete without a raft of personal gizmos in hand. <laughs> It's about time our iconic boxes were updated for the 21st century to be useful, more sustainable. See, I tried a little bit at the end. I didn't want to do the whole quote, though. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. I do like thinking of this as one of these little gizmos the kids are holding now. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can, of course, write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News Today. That's tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific. 1 p.m. Eastern. As for me, I'll be back here tomorrow, same time, same place. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.